días a todos. So we can get started. Good morning and welcome to the panel on production and trade to boost food security. We face an unprecedented crisis in terms of food security with the increase in the prices of agricultural inputs, fertilizers, and oil in addition to the volatility in the uh, food supply, which has led to disruptions in volumes and to higher prices. At the IDB Group, we have long been working to deal with these issues with our public sector colleagues and also through IDB um, Invest and IDB Lab with the private sector. At IDB Invest, we have increased our sustainable financing capacity for working capital, the largest source of demand during the last couple of years in this field. And uh, at IDB Lab, we've been working to apply technological innovations for the sake of sustainable agricultural production. Recent studies show that in our region, the share of the population suffering from food insecurity has risen from 32% in 2019 to 41% in 2021. And uh, Severe food insecurity has risen from 10% to 15% in the last uh, few years. We are talking about 30 to 35 million people in our region who, during the last three years, have seen uh, severe growth in food insecurity. The magnitude of the crisis is such that it requires joint interventions, both on the public and private sector fronts. This is why we have invited to this panel representatives from both sectors to discuss the topic of food insecurity through both lenses, seeking common work methods with a view to finding solutions. We'll kick off the panel with a question for uh, Mario Lubetkin from FAO. He is the uh, regional uh, representative and director general for Latin America and the Caribbean. FAO has recently published a report on food security and nutrition in Latin Latin America and the Caribbean, looking at the details with regard to increased figures of hunger and malnutrition, in addition to the structural problems that the region faces. Could you perhaps provide an overview as to the food insecurity situation in the region and what the differences are you see at FAO between the different countries? Yes, thank you, Aitor. Yes, indeed. I think you uh, uh, gave us a preview of the figures, the uh, annual report figures, uh, both regional and global, point to a clearly negative trend. Globally, we are talking about 828 million people who uh, go hungry every year. And we're talking about uh, 3,000, uh, 3, 3 or 3.1 3 million people who don't get the right food. It's not just about eating, but about eating right. Otherwise, the problem increases. And in Latin America, we see that currently about 56 million people are suffering from hunger, and some 268 million suffer some form of food insecurity, which accounts for 40 percent of the population, according to our data. Certainly, it is a trend that is on the increase due to natural factors. Uh, you know, uh, well, there's the economic crisis to the COVID, the war. And if you look at the results for the last year, we have seen an increase in 30 percent when it comes to hunger. And the most remarkable point is that our data continues to show that Latin America and the Caribbean can produce food for 1.3 billion people, almost twice the population we have in the region. And still, we have these results. And uh, according to a recent ECLAC report, we may be looking at 200 million people facing poverty. As you rightly pointed out, and as the IDB colleagues who uh, spoke before noted, we are optimistic in our action and uh, work with governments. We uh, think it's great to have this discussion with a view to combining public and private capacities, because we are fully convinced that no one by themselves will be able to deal with all of this. It's 
only through the combination of all capacities, governments, the private sector, civil society, academia, and of course with innovation matters that we will be uh, doing a deep dive into and well with the Minister of Honduras as well. We are seeing all of this. This is a concrete reality in many countries in Latin America. Our feeling uh, and our sensibilities have to do with the whole region, um, but we have a particular focus on the hardest hit regions such as Central America and the Caribbean countries. Recently in a conversation with the Caribbean ministers, they talked about a fundamental strategic program to reduce by 25 percent the uh, imports. They have a focus on tourism, and there are many challenges in Latin America that we can only deal with together. Thanks, Mario. You talked about the Secretary of Agriculture of the uh, Government of Honduras, uh, Lara Suazo. So you've been working very hard. Mr. Suazo in Honduras to enhance productivity in the agricultural sector while enhancing food security in the country. Some of these uh, policies are very long term, so they go well beyond a single administration. Could you tell us what these policies for the agriculture sector are about? Yes, certainly. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak on a panel that discusses such important topics such as food security, first and foremost. The Honduran experience reflects experience of a country that can't escape the global context. When you brought up the issue, you mentioned climate change, for instance, as well as other global matters that have an impact on all of our countries, the price of inputs, the price of fertilizers. All of that has a global impact, and imagine uh, if it has an impact on high-income countries, the, the increase in prices and the increase in end products, well, all the more so in the case of low-income countries. And I need to make this brief comment before responding to your question, because a state policy as is the case with Honduras, is also subject to the impact of global policies, which also have an impact. And another important thing when designing public policy is your own contextual history. Food security is a long-term issue. For years, we've been trying to find that magical formula so that countries like ours can achieve food security, and yet that hasn't materialized. And the other thing is that in order to define a policy for the agri-food sector, a foundation for planning and strategic planning requires that we find ways to end poverty, because in a country where seven out of ten people live in poverty, it's truly difficult to come up with public policies which in the short term will achieve the expected results, such as is the case with food security. In our case, we have worked for some six months as part of a true marathon, racing along with the main stakeholders and actors in the main food chains of of, uh, Honduras, trying to look at the current situation, looking at their dreams, where they want to be, and also looking at their constraints. And after analyzing all of this national context, we found that all change face very similar constraints. And many of the responses depend on decisions by the state, by government, but others depend on the connections and interrelations and partnerships with both private banking and public banking research centers globally and, of course, at the regional level, academic centers, for instance. And this also has to do with models that will enable technology transfers. Another key element has to do with the institutionality of the public sector. And in our case, it's about rebuilding trust at the Secretary's Office for Agriculture and Livestock. It's about enhanced reliability, transparency, and efficiency. But it's also about governance in the partnerships between institutions, groups, farmers, groups, businesses in the sector, with a view to ensuring that when a farmer comes along and wants to buy a bag of fertilizer and that costs three times more than 
uh, he would pay if he bought on a bulk basis. Well, that side of governance is one area we should focus on to improve. And then there's a few other topics that are extremely important in order to have a positive impact in the short run. And it seems to me that Honduras has a very favorable climate, even though we are vulnerable to climate change, but our climate makes it possible for us to grow many different crops that are currently not being grown. And these can be used to this could be sold to other countries who are willing and able to pay. But we need to address production issues. But to do that, we need investment capital. We could borrow and as a country and as producers. And yet, if we don't have support when it comes to marketing, if we don't have secure market outlets, even if we have a wide range of pricing, productive activity is not going to be able to produce results. And that is something that is extremely important and should be considered as part of public policies. And the last thing is innovation in agrologistics. As a country, we cannot continue to dream of high competitiveness indicators when the country needs to continue to borrow in order to digitize, extend um, power coverage, and do other things. Sometimes it's just having additional capacity in order to compete in other markets and generate income that can then be reinvested to secure our food security. So that is, in broad terms, what that policy needs to include. And one of the reasons why we are not better off than we are is because we don't have a visionary and strategic public policy that spells out what is needed in order to have solid investments in the short and medium term and that also indicates the expected results. Then there's also return on investment, which is something that has not been contemplated as part of policy thus far. Those are excellent points, and when it comes to policy association and how to bring in the producer, in order to have more efficient production means and to increase production volumes. Let's now turn to the private sector, starting with Rosario Bazan, CEO and founder of Damper, an exporting company in the fruit um, producing sector. Damper has been promoting a more efficient and also more inclusive food supply chain. I'd like to ask you, how has the food industry and the agricultural industry empowered women in Peru and boosted food security? Well, first of all, let me thank the IDB for offering me the opportunity to be here at this very important event to share information and also learn. The food and agriculture sector in Latin America plays a key role in ensuring the food security of our region and also in supporting food security around the world. It also contributes significantly to inclusive growth and the consequent reduction of structural poverty in our countries. Despite the many obstacles and pain points we have in the countries, Latin America and the Caribbean have become the number one exporting region for foods globally. And this has been possible because we have known how to position our products in the leading markets around the world by upholding top quality standards and mainly for products known as superfoods like avocado, blueberries, mango, asparagus, and others, just to mention a few. And yet, our region 
terrible realidad, una cruda also needs realidad, to face a very es, crude and difficult reality, and it is that 32% of our population lives in poverty. So 200 million no people lack access to basic services needed for human development. En, en, en país, Perú, and in my own country, Peru, es del 30 we have a 30% poverty level, which means that 10 million people in my country live in poverty. Esta situación se replica en la mayoría de and this países. situation can be found in the majority of countries. It jeopardizes our population, eso, their stability, and also our development. So that's why I find that, that business leaders and public sector leaders are called upon to help generate conditions for development as well as opportunities that will help reduce food insecurity and poverty, structural poverty. Given this situation, the food and agriculture sector in Peru has become the driver for decentralized development, and it is the main source of formal jobs. It provides jobs to 26% of the economically active population and has contributed to reducing structural poverty from 60% in 2000 to about 30% currently. Given this, the company I head, Danper, since its inception, has had a business model based on generating shared value. It connects profitability and progress for our company with that of our employees and their families and communities. These initiatives promote development, and one program which does this is PREDICA, which provides good quality jobs to women and also young men by providing them ongoing training. This makes them more productive. It also provides them with access to a better economic income. So they and their families are, are better off. It makes them more competitive and also makes our company more competitive. We also have data from the OCD, which tells us that women invest more than 30% of their income in education and food and nutrition for their children. Let me repeat that. That is in providing nutrition, health, and education for their children. That is why our company, Damper, offers development opportunities to our women by providing them with ongoing training, also taking care of their health in our facilities, offering them options to complete their primary and secondary education without having to stop working, and making sure that they have a safe and fair place to work. This is how we empower our women. This is what enables them to become agents of change, to have control over their own destiny, thereby guaranteeing not only their food security, but that of their families, and to contribute to the food security of all countries around the world. I am convinced that empowering women and that gender equity are essential factors if we're going to achieve economic growth and social development. This is how I believe that we can ensure the sustainable development of our countries. Let me thank the IDB for being a strategic partner in furthering the strategic development of our company and also of the food and agriculture sector in Peru. I'm also grateful to the IDB for having been at our side, for having guided us in achieving our EDGE certification. And it's the only certification in gender global. equity which has global evaluation standards. Thank you.
Muchas gracias, Rosario. Y Thank you very much, Rosario. El empoderamiento de la mujer en todo lo que it's very es, important to empower women, Damper, and es algo que you do that años, very well in Damper. You've been doing it for many years, and now you've been applying it in the context of food safety and security initiatives. Pereira, Still eh, with the private sector, Fatima eh, Pereira, who is the director for sustainability eh, at Multinversiones, which is a Central American eh, company in the food and agricultural Fatima, sector. Eh, eh, es realmente un ejemplo de cómo FMI, Fatima, desde el sector privado eh, habéis empujado de cómo el sector privado ha sido capaz de promover la innovación alimentaria. ¿Qué rol juega la industria chain? de alimentos en What el fortalecimiento de la seguridad alimentaria desde el punto de vista de innovación? Mira, el, el rol innovation. de la industria alimentaria, Thank honestamente, you. en términos de seguridad alimentaria, es ser parte de la solución. I think that Our role ser really parte has de la part, being part of the solution. Como, como What does this mean? Alimentos, tenemos una As responsabilidad a food de generar alimentos industry de calidad. member, Eso we have a responsibility to produce quality foods that provide adequate nutrition for our people in sufficient amounts. Foods have varied because consumers are entitled to have access to different foods and they have to be accessible. And by accessible, I mean from a geographic standpoint, all our communities, even the most vulnerable, should have access, but it also means being accessible from a pricing standpoint. I think that the important question becomes how do you do this? You do this with investment, innovation, and with agility, nimbleness. It's uh, the past two years from a food security standpoint have been unprecedented, multiple challenges stemming from the pandemic, from the war, and from the lack of products in the food supply, but Multinversiones last year announced an investment of $1.8 billion in Central America and the Caribbean, of which $1 million will be to ensure food security. It's only if we continue to believe and invest in our productive apparatus to expand capacity, that's the only way for us to truly address food security. So it's innovation and investing in products and in making our processes more effective to support digital platforms that can connect us with the consumers, innovation when it comes to logistics, and then nimbleness. We need to be flexible to address different types of situations, and this means that we need to be very disciplined. We need to control expenditures. We must also have rigor when it comes to our raw materials. We must also be able to connect with non-traditional markets, and we do that when we buy grain, also buy inputs in advance to avoid any interruptions in the supply chain that would jeopardize food security. So we do believe that the role of private companies and the food industry, given that we don't do this alone, we work with other partners, is to become a part of the solution by investing, innovate. being flexible, sí, and also Fatima, by no innovating. Thank no you, Fatima. Minister Suazo mentioned it. There's no innovation without investment. So that is where the private sector comes in. that very clear. Let's go back to the public sector, and I will ask Vice Minister Schall a question. She represents the government of Belize. Belize is a country where smallholders are relevant in the agricultural value chains in the country. How does the government work with the private sector to integrate these smallholders into the value chains and improve their productivity levels? but also not only the producti productivity levels uh, of them, but also their individual food security. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here to represent the government of Belize and the people of Belize. Uh, I want to thank the Inter-American Development Bank for this opportunity to address this gathering today. Um, agriculture is a very important a part of Belize's economy. It is one of the two main pillars of our economy. We have agriculture and tourism. Agriculture makes up about, agriculture production makes up about 14% of our national GDP. 
and accounts for about 17% of um, employment in the economy. Uh, much of the agriculture <clears throat> that we have is uh, due to our his to, uh, history as a colony, and we export um, a lot of commodities, um, which makes up about 80% of the exports of the country. Uh, but because of this, um, the, the, the exports are, are very limited to citrus, sugar, and bananas. And we end up still importing about $220 million worth of food products into the country every year. Nonetheless, um, Belize is one of the most food secure countries in Central America, but also in the Caribbean. We consume, um, of all the food we consume, 60% of it is produced in, in the country and in Belize. No? Um, so some of the things we're doing in Belize is we're, tr we're diversifying from the traditional commodities into new uh, higher value agricultural products. And in this way, we are um, bringing in new actors and new players into the agriculture sector, working with small farmers. Um, we're also looking at um, uh, the, the hurdles that agribusiness and small farmers face in agricultural production. And one of the things that we are doing is looking at the policies of the government that sometimes act as a barrier or a hurdle to this uh, development. And so we have been uh, removing some of the tariffs and taxes on inputs um, for agricultural producers. We are entirely dependent on um, the private sector for agricultural production in Belize. And so to expand the integration of all players into the entire supply chain and the value chain, we have no choice but to work directly with uh, the private sector as our partners. Uh, we believe in the, in the capacity of the private sector for innovation and growth and to, to, to drive the change that we need to diversify the economy, but also in the process ensure food security for the country. Um, we maintain very close relationship with agribusiness. Whenever they have a problem or an issue, they bring it to us as the government, and we try to be as responsive as possible, and I'll respond also as quickly as possible. For instance, uh, recently, uh, agribusinesses came to the government and said a lot of the inputs that we use, that we're trying to use to move up the value chain are being taxed. Uh, too high, and uh, it's creating a problem because the end product then becomes very expensive to put on the market and it's not competitive. And so what we did was remove those duties and taxes on those so that they can have a competitive product, finished product, to, they can put on the shelves. Um, we're also providing uh, fiscal incentives for smaller producers, um, especially for enterprises that are led by women and youth um, and small farmers. Uh, in the past, fiscal incentives were reserved only for large businesses and large investors. But if it's good for large businesses and large investors, it's also good for the small, small producers and small businesses. And so uh, we have also uh, now developed a, a fresh package of incentives for small businesses so that they can begin to participate in the supply chain in agricultural production. But beyond that, we have also um, a, removed all forms of taxation on small businesses for the first three years of their life so that they can grow. Uh, it doesn't make sense to begin taxing them as they register their company. You, you let them grow. Uh, you allow them a chance and space um, to innovate, to, to produce, to become profitable before you begin to think of, of taxing them. And so that's, those are some of the, the things that we're doing. Of course, the government has a very important role to play. Um, some of the other things that we're doing is ensuring that there is a, the right infrastructure, both in terms of energy and roads and, 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 and markets um, for agro-producers. Um, and we're also encouraging and promoting the, the integration of technology in, in agriculture production as well. 
So there's a, there's a long road ahead, but we're very optimistic. We're very hopeful about the future. We have seen the effects and the beneficial effects that our policies have had on agricultural production. We have increased our exports. We have begun to see the diversification happening in the local market. And um, all of this has resulted in ensuring that we are able to feed ourselves as a country. As a matter of fact, we were able to weather the storm of COVID because we were able to produce our own food and consume our own food. Uh, and so uh, this is just a few of the experiences that we have had in Belize, and we continue to work. We have a clear plan with the government and the Ministry of Economic Development and Agriculture, and we uh, constantly review these plans to see where changes need to be made. It is important that the government facilitate the growth of business, especially agribusiness, and to do everything possible to ensure that um, it provides jobs and employment, it provides uh, foreign currency for the country through exports, and it provides income especially for rural families, and in this way address the issue of poverty as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Minister. Claro ejemplo de como this el is a very solo clear no example hacerlo. of how the public el sector cannot do it alone, nor can the private sector, so it's important for them to communicate y, y and to set up mechanisms esa, and platforms to engage in that discussion and find Tenemos solutions. En el panel a On Marshall, the panel, we also have Clédio Marshall, who is the finance Polar, director of the LAR Group. It is um, Brazilian cooperative, which also works in the southern cone. We've been hearing about small, or from small countries, and now we turn to large countries over the past 30 years. Brazil, from an agro-food standpoint, has grown so much that it's now one of the leading food producers in the world. And that has been achieved by both public and private sector initiatives. What do you think is the factor that accounts for your country's leading role in this area? Thank you, Aitor, and thank you to the IDB for the invitation. I'm here today representing our firm and also our country, Brazil. You said it quite well, Brazil has become one of the leading food producers in the hemisphere. Over the past 40 years, we went from being importers to being food exporters. From 1975 to 2017, our production went from 46 to 312 billion tons per year. This is striking because this is a six-fold increase compared to where we were in 1975. But our food production area went from 29 to 68 million hectares, which means that the area grew at a rate of or 3.2 times. So our production increased sixfold. And yet the area use for production only increased I3.2 times. So we believe that this spectacular growth is due to one factor, and it is a stronger role by science and technology in 1973, we created Embrapa, which is the Brazilian company for agricultural research. Pero con eh, claro objetivo it de ayudar las empresas, empresas y también a public el sector agency, but it also supports más companies in the private sector so that they can produce more using technology, eh, partnering with researchers. Fundamos oficinas de Embrapa and soya, we set up maíz, Embrapa café, officers for, cerdos, uh, uh, for soy, corn and other products. La we del also para agricultura familiar, con focused on family agriculture, que, offering uh, family subsidized credit. 
Entonces, and that also tecnología, had an impact on sustainability. So technology, mayor, productivity, mayor, more production, less land la for production, and sustainability. Eh, a partir de Embrapa, so, la, Embrapa, la siembra directa en la paja, que es una tecnología muy importante para nosotros conservarmos el suelo. Y también uh, corregimos suelo degradado con agua, con lluvia y otras Till. causas importantes. Nosotros en apenas 7.6% de nuestro territorio para agricultura. Entonces, eh, Aitor, nosotros creemos que so, Aitor, tenemos las condiciones necesarias y viendo nuestras right condiciones. Eh, and after listening países, to creemos que panelists from other countries, I would say that technology uh, and innovation, as you said, e are key factors. These are incentives for small units to produce sustainably, and also for larger landholders claro with public investment, but also with a clear objective, which is to step up productivity in a manner that is sustainable. Thank you, Clerio. This is yet another example of how the public sector in Brazil several decades ago had a vision and established Embrapa with the purpose of providing technological support to develop agricultural platforms and the private sector was on board with the initiative and use those platforms in order to produce more and more sustainably. The second part of the title of this panel relates with trade, and I will turn or focus my next question on that. This is one thing which organizations have discussed with governments. They've been encouraging governments not to adopt protectionist measures. How do you maintain a steady food supply? What measures are being used across the region? Well, first of all, we have been listening to comments by other speakers. And what I would say is that for FAO, thinking of future sustainability, what is important is overhauling our agri-food systems. What this means is to do what our public sector colleagues and our private sector colleagues have described. It is important to find a formula for a sustainable solution which is respectful of the environment. We also need to have financing, to have markets, to have transparency, transportation and technology. So this is a package which we call transformation of agri-food systems that are, that to achieve this transformation. I think all of this needs to be in place. But we start with a point made by a previous panelist. Right now, to give you numbers, we have annually 41.6% of production in Latin America and the Caribbean is exported, which means an agri-food surplus of $174 million per year. So we are not starting off from a negative position, not at all. I'd like to focus on two things. You spoke of a multilateral approach, and this is something that became important in the final post-COVID stage. We have a long list of elements to help governments, but I would only mention three. First, guaranteeing access and mobility in the transportation sector was one of the major issues and it's still there. Also, guaranteeing ports and access to ports, and this is not just in the context of Ukraine, and then also avoiding any restrictive measures on exports and imports which could curtail regional and international trade. These were the measures that were put in place when we're looking at emergency context and also at the current situation. We play a leading role when it comes to guaranteeing or striving to guarantee 
agricultural security and sustainability. And I can summarize it in a number of points. We support governments in order to keep the trade and foods and fertilizers open, reducing restrictive measures internationally, and bolstering intra-regional trade. Secondly, and these are not ranked in order, improving transparency. This is essential for markets and for the public and private sectors, avoiding speculation by making use of all the tools and digital platforms available to ensure transparency and access to information. The IDB has developed outstanding instruments, which I think are very Also maintaining the purchasing power of the most vulnerable through cash and in-kind transfers, as the poorest segments need to have an active role as part of the process, also supporting family-based agriculture as uh, indicated by a Brazilian colleague and artisanal fisheries to produce nutritional value products and also for uh, territory management. We focus on smallholder farmers, on family-based production and on fisheries production because that is the line between production and poverty. It's 80 percent of producers in Latin America and the Caribbean that we are talking about. Unless we help them, we're going to get thousands hundreds of million people falling below the poverty line. So we need those productive projects. Finally, we need to develop platforms, as already mentioned. We have Mano de la Mano, a platform with over 60 countries on board, Honduras being one of them. And through the data we have and the global data, as well as based on, on science-based experiences. The idea is to channel investments with guarantees that strengthen the prospects for countries. And digitalization is vital. Without that, we will not be able to do it. And yesterday, we actually talked about this with the president of the IDB. I think the time has come where all ideas need to be truly tangible and concrete. Time is short. We need quick results. That's the demand of society. And I think we can do it. Thanks, Mario. Tackling the challenges faced by smallholder farmers um, when it comes to poverty, we must work on that, especially rural poverty. And smallholder farmers, through more efficient methods, can increase the production. And carrying on with trade. Small country like, uh, like Belize, agricultural production volumes are small, but the issues and concepts related to food security and food insecurity are not necessarily that different from those of uh, larger countries. Can you please explain what is the regulatory framework that, you, that your government has in place in terms of trade, uh, in terms of investments to facilitate uh, agricultural production? You were mentioning some of them uh, in the, your previous intervention, but maybe you can get into more detail. Uh, thank you. 75% um, <clears throat> of the agriculture producers in Belize are smallholders. So that's where we, we start from. And so um, it's important for us to, to look at their needs, to see how we can support their, their interests and their needs in terms of their agriculture production. Um, a lot of the things that we're doing right now in Belize is especially the smallholder farmers being on the borderline of poverty, we need to ensure that they don't fall below the poverty line, as our colleague from the FAO is saying. And one way we're, one way we're doing that is we're taking our approach to climate adaptation and taking advantage of it and using it as a way to build the capacity of small farmers. Um, uh, this is either through just capacity building, training, equipment, new technologies, um, in order for them to be able to feed themselves, but also to produce surplus for the local economy and the local market. Um, we also have a very broad push for the rebuilding of cooperatives in the country. Um, you know, cooperatives have been something that have worked in the past, but for some reason have been forgotten. And so it provides a, a structure for small farmers to become involved 
in, in production and become involved and participate in the economic life of the country, especially those from rural areas. And so without structure, without a platform to participate, this is how they get left behind. And so we see that the cooperative system is a very uh, important system. It holds a lot of potential for small farmers to become involved and to participate. And we use this as a channel to, to bring further support to them as, as we're doing now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are looking at uh, providing incentives for small producers in order for them to, to grow their agriculture production, uh, looking at all the inputs that they need for their farms, um, including technologies. But this includes um, a climate smart agriculture in interventions, expanding irrigation, uh, expanding greenhouses, greenhouse uh, structures or cover structures as we call them. Um, and in this way, uh, help the small farmers to, to become much more um, productive. But overall, what, what we're doing is looking at the, the picture of rural life, of livelihoods, of agricultural production, and seeing what challenges they face and working together with them what we, one by one, we're moving those challenges out of the way in order for them to have the opportunity that they need to feed themselves, to feed their families, to earn an income, and to contribute to the growth of the economy. But it all starts with the government being very responsive to the needs of the communities in rural areas, responsive to the needs of the private sector, ensure that you move quickly and pragmatically to address policy hurdles, um, and not wait for years, as our colleague from FAO says, we need actions that produce results now, because that's what the people demand and that's what, what we're doing. As you will see, again and again, the issue of smallholder farmers keeps coming up. And the Vice Minister has also addressed an important matter in terms of how smallholders associate themselves uh, through cooperativism. And here we have an example as to how an agricultural cooperative can work well. Your cooperative brings together the thousands of smallholder farmers and micro farmers. So through that, how have you contributed to more sustainable food production? Thanks, Aitor. Our cooperative is today marking 59 years right on this day. So the way we see it, cooperativism is the best way to bring together and create synergies to enhance jobs, income, and sustainability for smallholders. We currently have 13,000 members in our cooperatives many of whom are smallholder farmers, but teamed up in the cooperative, smallholder farmers can buy high quality inputs at competitive prices because, as someone mentioned earlier, the greater quantities lead to better prices for our cooperative members. So our cooperative takes care of all of that process. Once the inputs have been purchased, the supplies have been purchased, we process the production of the cooperative members by adding value to the primary production, whether it be soya, maize, uh, transforming the production when it comes to uh, chicken and also to pork. So meat that is to be exported to over 175 countries. And we have a presence in all states of our federation. And also in some countries as uh, already mentioned here in the Americas. We provide technical assistance 
which is a key point because smallholders don't have all of the technical conditions and knowledge to do the sowing and to uh, conduct their activities in the best possible way. So we provide technical assistance, a good deal of training. We also provide support for our cooperative members all along the production chain, right from the time of sowing. Uh, and um, also when it comes to um, breeding the animals, like chicken and, uh, chickens and pigs. So we work quite intensively with our members, with our cooperative members, and sustainability is at the heart of our mission. The importance of cooperativism is the social value besides the um, economic value. Our mission is to bring our members to a better economic and financial condition through social work, working on the sustainability front so that all of our processes are taken uh, stock of um, in terms of the CO2 impact. We're also working a lot on regenerative agriculture and biological inputs. So all of these actions, we believe, are conducive when the smallholder farmers come together within the cooperative, and all of that is crucial to improve improve conditions and also to alleviate poverty and hunger. Thank you. Clelio Rosario, in your previous statement, you talked about uh, the empowerment of women for greater productivity within your company. But smallholder farmers are also key for Dumper, and uh, it's interesting to, to see how you work with them. Could you tell us about the kinds of initiatives your company has for smallholders? When we co-funded Dumper 29 years ago, we didn't have a single uh, hectare of our own. So our initial um, vertical integration was zero. However, it was crucial for us to secure the trust of smallholders. And ever since then, we started to bring on board smallholders as part of our value chain by providing knowledge, technology, and also helping them gain access to fertilizers, seeds, and high quality Planted. In that way, for 29 years now, we have been helping incorporate smallholders into the global food value change. I think there's no way to ensure the sustainability of our value chain with a view to the food security our countries and the planet require other than by being able to develop our smallholder farmers in a structural and systematic fashion. This is why at a company we have been working with smallholders in order for them to be able to raise their productivity expand their agricultural border, diversify the products, and thereby get them to overcome the trap of subsistence agriculture, thereby also improving their quality of life. We can see that a significant percentage of the most vulnerable population segment depends on family-based agriculture uh, precisely. It's a paradox, but smallholders in our countries who contribute to our own food security are the ones that lack food security. 
pertenecen a la Because población más vulnerable. Entonces, por eso es que estamos llamados a incorporar a los pequeños agricultores a las cadenas de abastecimiento tanto calidad y, y precios through quality and competitive prices. In this way, we will manage to get smallholders to bolster their capacities and skills. A Danpa, hand in hand with our smallholders, we've been able to conquer the main artichoke market, which is the United States. We supply 70% uh, we we uh, supply 70% of the supermarkets in the U.S., and this we do side by side with our smallholders, uh, offering training to them on an ongoing basis, and uh, we support them throughout the whole process, and we help them perform the control at each of the critical points in the operation so as to ensure compliance with the highest standards of quality, and in that way, they can contribute to the food security of their own families as they generate income based on their productivity, and in that way, they contribute to world food security. And the other point I'd like to add has to do with the fundamental importance of working with smallholder farmers because as they improve their quality of life, we achieve an impact in terms of a healthy and socially peaceful environment, which is vital in order to create sustainability in our ecosystem. And in that way, we can strengthen our contribution to the sustainable development of our countries and also enhance our contribution to global food security. Thanks, Rosario. And uh, Fatima, we've been hearing about sustainability, but in a more oblique sort of way. Um, actually, FME is, CMI is a company that seriously uh, takes the issue of uh, environmental and social sustainability, both in production and throughout the whole uh, supply and production change. What are the experiences that CMI is driving in terms of sustainability and food security? Thank you, Aitor. Before getting into the concrete experience, let me share a thought. To us, sustainability is the business strategy. It is not something that we do as a side dish or romantic thing. This is at the core or our business strategy, and that's how we live. Our goal is to feed the world, to provide well-being, and if we are betting on food security, we don't lose sight of the required sustainability. And I can share three concrete experiences. And part of our success, I think, at the end of the day has had to do with the fact that we had a focus and clear priorities. On the climate change front, our most tangible experience has to do with the fact that in the last eight years, we've been able to reduce uh, over 110,000 tons of CO2 through two super simple initiatives. The first one being innovation in the uh, feed for our avian chain. Part of our business focus on that. We have spectacularly innovated uh, in our feeding processes, which improves the digestion of our chickens. And this has an impact in terms of CO2. Also, uh, solar panels, which also has a positive impact on CO2 emissions and has a positive business impact. And the third point, which I'm passionate about, and after hearing Rosario, I think we are very much on the same wavelength and share that. We, we need to believe in and strengthen our value chain. There's no such thing as individual success. An individual business will not grow alone unless the chain is empowered. We have a uh, chicken-related uh, business called the Casa del Rey. Some may see it just as a chicken business, but we see it as a point of empowerment through partnerships like the one we have with you uh, at IDB Invest. We offer technical and financial training to women who have this point of sale 
um, they sell chicken within vulnerable communities, but they have the technical skill, they get training on financial, marketing, and sales, and also with a focus on resilience, so that women who also need to take care of their families, they often support their families, they are integrated into the production structure of their country. And the last experience I'd like to share is how we are betting on nutrition. I think that in addition to offering quality products to all that are accessible and affordable to all, we also offer products that help tackle one of the key challenges we have in Central America, malnutrition or undernutrition. And we have our social arm, the Juan Bautista Gutierrez Foundation. We have a beautiful project as part of which we offer uh, nutrition through the NutriBien product, which is supported by the World Food Program with all of the data requirements to uh, fight malnutrition and poor nutrition. And it's a beautiful uh, job offering uh, proper food and nutrition to communities, especially with the focus on the early years of children so that those children may grow healthy and be part of the production structure in the future. So clear examples of the uh, options to fight food insecurity by working sustainably both on the social and environmental fronts. Mr. Um, Suazo, you talked about this in your first statement. Both the private and public sectors need to work together. Other panelists have also highlighted this. But in Honduras, there are examples as to how both sectors work together. Could you perhaps highlight some examples? Examples of this? Yes. Look, um, after all I've heard here by way of the response to food insecurity, let me tell you that at the Secretary of Agriculture of Honduras, we have a motto, United by Agro. And I see again here that all of these experiences require bringing together partnerships with integration. And of course, many examples could be given. But First, let me say that there's a global need to recognize the value of the work done by agricultural workers and farmers, men, women, and youth in the rural context. It's physical work, but it is work that is not duly recognized. This morning, I had a bottle of water at a hotel, and it was $10.50, just a liter of water. I started doing the maths in my mind right away, and I said, my goodness, 10.50 represents 20 liters of milk. If I were to, you know, fresh milk straight from the producers. Only a week ago, promoting an agricultural fair uh, strategy at uh, municipalities and villages. This would have been 80 carrots, 15 pounds of uh, beans. And it's not that the water doesn't have the value. There's the packaging, the brand, and so on. But it also makes me think about what we need to do to learn to integrate with uh, private businesses, especially on the marketing side, to add the needed value to generate higher income. I think I will leave the question at this. There's a whole lot of experiences, especially as regards the international cooperation sector. That is a key actor that we haven't touched upon. There's a whole amount, millions and millions of dollars that have been invested in our countries, including my own, sorry. But I think when you look at the partnerships, the most important thing is for us to be clear in our minds as to what agreements and contracts we enter into with private business and uh, through international cooperation and how the results will help looking at the indicators. In my own case, my main responsibility is to ensure production. Fortunately, we have a president, the first woman president in the country, but she's also uh, a farmer. So she firmly believes in the need for changes in agriculture to alleviate poverty. So I think those partnerships with private business can be mutually beneficial. So 
sell labor, work, and products for sale. But in exchange for that, we want good prices for farmers so that we can all eat well, but also to create seed capital in the pockets of all farmers so that tomorrow they won't depend on handouts, on social bonds, so that they can make their own decisions and say, I'm going to invest in this. So my conclusion has to do with the great importance of partnerships at all levels, and we all need each other. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we conclude this panel. I hope you have enjoyed the uh, top-notch uh, presentations, and it's clear that the private and public sectors work together and will continue to do so to fight food insecurity. Thank you very much, and thanks to our panelists.